Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about C.S. Lewis and his thoughts on spiritual warfare. Before I start talking much about it, though, I'm curious from you, what comes to mind when I say spiritual warfare? Screw-tape letters. Screw-tape letters, absolutely. What else? Timothy, or Paul speaking to Timothy. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 6. You're the second person in the second workshop to have looked at my notes and say that. But that's, you know, there's good reason. It means you're biblical. It means you're biblical. You're reading your Bible. What else? Craziness. Craziness. What do you mean by that? Well, it can get kind of squirrely. Some you know, people start talking about spiritual warfare and suddenly there's a demon behind every bush. And that kind of thing. I might not call on you anymore. You're looking at my notes. <laughs> you're going to give it away. You know Lewis too well. Anyone else? What, what comes to mind when, we, when the word spiritual warfare is thrown out in a conversation or something in church? Dangerous. Or even when I flippantly said it's spiritual warfare, that i got to file Lyle Dorset. Dangerous. Dangerous. Absolutely. Ground level versus territorial spirits. Hmm. Okay. And I heard real. Yeah, that... Frank Pirelli. We, someone brought him up in the last one, too. Frank Pirelli. Yeah. He, he touches on that a lot. Absolutely. These things emerge sort of like, you know, the true myth. Uh, you know, it's real, so it's going to emerge in all sorts of things. Prayer. What's that? Prayer. Prayer. Absolutely. Well, like Gary there, uh, and there's a reason why I picked Gary to be a mentor in our program here in the Fellows in Chicago, uh, Ephesians 6 is what comes, comes to mind for me uh, immediately. And so I think it's worth, because uh, we don't do enough public reading of Scripture, although we've done a lot this week, I, th I thought we would do a little bit more. Paul tells the, writes the Ephesians that we should put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for, for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the, book, given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. When it comes to spiritual formation, I like, uh, and there's so many different definitions, and I did some homework on this, and a friend of mine who's working on his Ph.D. at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School who's actually a full colonel in the Marine Corps, but also a pastor in the PCA church, uh, has done some writing on this. And, you know, we heard about territorial, uh, there, there are different ways of thinking about spiritual warfare, uh, and they're not all necessarily mutually exclusive. But I like how David Paulson, who works with CCF and the Gospel Coalition, uh, describes spiritual warfare. He says it's the moral conflict in the Christian life. Or Craig Keener, theologian, says that missions and the Christian life our spiritual warfare. So my goal for this workshop today is to try to hear Lewis as much as possible. I got a lot of ideas. They don't all necessarily need to be heard. Uh, but Lewis has done a lot more thinking, and I think we're more interested. We're here because we're more interested to hear what Lewis has to say. So I'm going to throw up a lot of Lewis's thoughts sprinkled in with uh, a few other folks, as well as uh, once in a while I'll interject. But I'm also wanting to generate some discussion. But we'll primarily survey Lewis's thought. But before we jump into that. Uh, let's go into another question. Why don't we pay more attention to spiritual warfare? Why do you think that is? We heard someone say it's real. It's scary. Scary. Very much so. You can't see it. Exactly. It's the invisible realm, right? Yes, sir. Um, Western culture, anti-supernatural worldview. That's right. And that's something Lewis talks about, sort of brings up a lot in miracles, right? We are supernaturalists. We're a particular brand, particular type, but yeah, uh, we are materialists. If it's not something we can see, improve, and measure. We don't believe in sin anymore a lot of times. You know, the world of you is... That's I right. It says sin is a naughty word. We don't even think about it. That's right, and I think you can even relate that a little bit to his comment about, you know, in a material world, you know, all of these things have some sort of biological or physical ex explanation. I think we just accept it as part of the fallen world can't really overcome it that much, so you kind of just preach your teeth. Yes, that's good. Sort of a denial, maybe. Yeah. I think a lot of times the enemy just lulls us into the 
the thoughts. Don't be ready. Don't be extreme. It's not real. Yeah. Ah, there's nothing to see here. <laughs> Keep moving on. Nothing to see here. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So I think it's real. I feel it in my life. And I work. And you know it's there. Oh, yeah. I agree. It's real. Um, I think we oftentimes will try to explain it away. And I'm wondering why we why are we doing that? Um, you have to be careful that you don't point and say everything is spiritual. Yes. <laughs> you be real careful. That that's very true. Um, there are moral and spiritual causes for problems, but there's also physical causes, psychological. So there are more causes than always spiritual. You're right. You got something from? Oh, yeah. Um, sometimes we don't. It's like we don't really fully see what's really going on. Yes. Yeah, we see through a, a, a glass half darkly. You know, I'm butchering that, but uh, we there's ambiguity. We don't see the whole thing. Oftentimes, hindsight's 2020, and so sometimes it's clearer looking back at. Oh yeah, that's right. Well. Um, those are all good, uh, and we'll talk, hopefully, uh, we'll unpack a little bit more with uh, Lewis. We'll touch on some of these things, and I think uh, it's an astute group. We've already touched on a lot, but, of course, uh, Lyle has uh, stolen some of my thunder in the last one about, uh, you know, the, the, the two opposite errors we can do in this. But let's hear what Lewis has to say to sort of frame this before we go in much deeper. In Mere Christianity, he says, Christianity agrees that this universe is at war. But it does not think this is a war between independent powers. It thinks this is a civil war, a rebellion that we are living in a part of the universe occupied by the rebel. Enemy occupied territory, that's what this world is. And then as Lyle started to allude to in his last talk uh, in the screw tape letters, Lewis says this in the preface, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. And the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Uh, you know, Lewis cautions against this. We don't want to. We don't want to over our imaginations. And last September or October, we had Jerry Root speak for us uh, in the Southwest suburbs on his latest book that you saw there, the surprising imagination of C.S. Lewis. But on that talk, he focused specifically on the uses and abuses of imagination. And you heard him say that there's no real learning being done without imagination, even in the hard physical sciences. You have to have imagination in order to be creative. And in order to share the Christian life, there's a lot of, it requires imagination to be able to take it into your context. But we can also misuse our imagination, and spiritual warfare is certainly one of those realms. Uh, of the importance, Lewis says, our leisure even our play is a matter of serious concern. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. In assessing Satan's strategy, Lewis goes on to say elsewhere, like a good chess player, Satan is always trying to maneuver you into a position where you can save your castle only by losing your bishop. I'll say that again. He's trying to maneuver you into a position where you can save your castle only by losing your bishop. Our time and those things that we do at play and at leisure are of utmost importance. Uh, I think some things get over, overly uh, focused on. You know, we want to make sure we're not watching a movie that's got too much sex or violence in it. But what are you doing with your time? Well, how are your priorities? Are you making time to spend? Are you spending time with God every day? Are you whittling it away on some useless things? Has God called you to something? Um, and, we'll, that, that, and that's from uh, an essay called Membership in the Weight of Glory. And then this one. Uh, Lewis said, A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation is. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. He goes on and says that this is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is the only man who knows the full of that temptation. 
This means he's the only complete realist. And this reminded me of something Bonhoeffer wrote in some things he wrote on temptation. He said that if God would not let us to be tempted beyond our ability, you know, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13, then the temptations and sufferings of Christ by virtue of His very divinity and what He could handle are beyond even our own comprehension. But back into our realm of the mere mortal, although you've never met a mere mortal, but of humans, we don't have that ability to, uh, we don't have that divine aspect to us. Temptation, we often hear from others, well, you don't know what it's like with this struggle. And that's not necessarily true. It could be some sort of addiction that you don't understand, but it also may be true that that person has been able to withstand it. I mean, look, at, look at a guy like Billy Graham. Think of the intense pressure he has been under over these years to make sure he doesn't stumble and he doesn't fall. Nobody knows what that kind of, very few people know that kind of pressure. 2 Corinthians says that for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We heard about that with Lyle, didn't we? Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So Lewis framed the discussion. I wanted to end with a little bit of scripture on a positive note because it can get very, when we talk about spiritual warfare, it can very quickly get into uh, scariness or despair or discouragement. But we have divine power to draw on. We do not have to despair. We do not have to be discouraged. Um, at a time in my life when I didn't even tell this person that I was uh, getting down, uh, the former president of the Institute, Tom Terrence, sent me this neat little essay. Uh, it was called The Devil's Best Tool. And it just says that uh, the devil was having a garage sale and some guy comes on and he's looking at all of these things that he can, wants to buy and then he sees this one oddly weird shaped tool and says, oh, why isn't that, but it had a sign that said, not for sale. It said, why can't I buy that one? He goes, oh, no, 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 that one's not for sale. That's discouragement. With that tool, I can wedge my way in anyone's heart. And uh, it was amazing. I didn't even tell him that I was, I was in a period of great discouragement. He sent that to me out of nowhere. It was obviously the Holy Spirit. So do not be discouraged. We have divine power. If you're living, if we're preaching the resurrection, then you have divine power. So I want to finish our framing of the discussion on that. So now another dis a question for you. How are you aware of spiritual warfare in your own life? Are you aware of it in your own life? I'm, I'm curious to hear some examples. And maybe even now after the, a couple of days of hearing uh, Lyle and Jerry and Marge and a little bit later from Wayne, maybe there are some things that the Holy Spirit is starting to nudge you with. And I'm curious where you have been uh, aware of it or where you may have been blind and something's coming to light now. Because others here might want to hear that and, and learn from that a little bit. In my thought life. How so? A, a horrible thought will come to me, you know, like, yeah, why do I need to go on living or something like that? I mean, I, and I'm, oh, I'm, you know, obviously I know suicide is a horrible sin. And I immediately say out loud, that is from the enemy, get out of there. Yes. And we have all sorts of thoughts pop in our head. Yeah. And you don't, you think, where did this come from? I wasn't even, you know, maybe I was having a good day. Why would I think a thought like that? Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Lack of discipline. Lack of discipline. Yeah, in all sorts of things, too. Yeah. Doesn't have to be the big ones. It's all about. Yes, sir. Um, there's times where uh, my wife and I will have um, disagreements and we'll get into conflict. And um, in the middle of it, either one of us will just stop and say, time out. Are we being messed with here? Mm -hmm. And then as we stop and pray, we realize two things. One, um, it's really something that, uh, you know, it just almost feels like it's pulling us into the fight. And second is usually the timing of it is very suspicious. Mm -hmm. It's usually before a big decision or a big event coming up. And it's just, you know, that's one way a spiritual worker shows up in, in our house. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, and that? Uh, in the workplace. In the workplace, how so? Um, because of the, I would say, contemporary requirements and uh, political correctness, um, mm. we are afraid to say that you know I'm a Christian. It's almost like um, like you. 
said like it was in Nazi Germany before they were trying to say, hey, this is wrong. Yeah. You know, even so I don't know how to defend the core identity of myself. Mm. Because yeah. of the workplace requirements and, and the society. It's hard. You can face all sorts of ethical dilemmas at work. I, it's, it's probably the number one place where we feel a lot of this. Ken Boas said that if God doesn't define who you are at work, or God doesn't define who you are, work probably will. And the work life can really overwhelm whether you become a workaholic or you just can't maintain that identity of being in Christ there. That's, that's good. Someone else? Nidia? Uh, when I start to pray more, I realize that uh, coincidentally, just things start to go wrong in my life. And I'm prepared and I think about it and I start to be cautious and I think, should I, should I bother praying? Because I, I don't want more struggles to start occurring. But I know I need to be disciplined in my prayer life. So I'm very aware of that. So yeah, you start moving positively and it gains attention, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Christy? Just kind of piggybacking on that, we, um, our family hosted a neighborhood Bible club in our backyard a few weeks ago, and <laughs> you know when you have people praying for you and when you have when you're opening you know your home to children and teaching them the gospel, um, I think it's just a, a, a right battlefield for spiritual warfare. And John ended up, my husband ended up in the hospital for several days during that week. Um, and I and we had so many prayers, and I, I and I felt the prayers, and then there would be a time, I swear, every morning, the the first morning of club, I sp I dumped my entire tea down my down myself because I'm trying to get ready, and I'm like, oh, rah, rah. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> it's the little things. <laughs> Satan wants to steal my joy if he can't do it in the big because, you know, we had a lot of stuff, and I kept praying through that, but it's in the little things where I'm tempted to be angry or frustrated and. Wait a minute. You know that's that's stealing my joy. I, yeah. I, I'm not gonna let that happen. That's good. That's good. Elaine. You just described Monday of the conference for me because <laughs> I could <laughs> so see God at work and that the big things were going very well, but there were all these little things going wrong that no one probably knew. And these lovely ladies up here, my scrabble partners. And One or two more examples of uh, spiritual warfare in your life, Dave. I, I think about, like uh, I was mentioning about honor for cost, counting the cost of this kind of Counting the yeah. Being committed to him. Certainly you see more of that when you are committed to Christ. Um, I was going to say this morning when Lyle was talking, I was reminded of my relationship with my family, my sisters. And it's been a difficult relationship because it's been a challenge knowing how to share you know, Christianity with them and some of these ideas. And I was just convicted to pray more for them, you know, just from his testimony of that man that had prayed for him for so many years. And I was like, wow, I need to pray for my family. I think that's a good place. Right, one more, one more down here, Gemma. Um, I was gonna say for me, it's, it comes a lot of times when comforts are removed from my life, and it's um, if I find myself, for example, in a place where I'm less near people um, around me in my life, but it's not an intentional quiet retreat, which is something in my life made it more quiet or more lonely. Um, that comfort's taken away, and if I'm not intentionally planning to use it for something, um, I'm more susceptible. Having those discouraging thoughts that someone's mentioned just entering my head, and be like, oh, where did that come from? And having to recognize it and to say that's not of God. Yeah. Um, to, to manage it. One more. James says, I think it's in chapter three, that where there is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder in every vile practice. And he says mm -hmm. that wisdom is not from above, but it is behind it. And so sometimes. 
I have to ask myself in a situation that just seems, you know, it's just very confusing and it's not a straight line, it's like a drunk baby is flying around. And so I say, is there bitter jealousy or selfish ambition that the devil can use to create chaos? Yes. And then he goes on to instruct us what wisdom is from above. That's a good, good reminder. To think about our enemy, and it's almost like you saw my next slide, we need, as Lyle alluded to, I spent 20 years as an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps, and, and one of the things we do is we study our enemy. We need to know what he or she is up to, um, and it just takes some time to think on these things. And we, want to, we want to be prepared. You know, Paul talks in one of the letters that we know he, uh, the devil's evil schemes. Uh, and it was not a, a, a passage explicitly on, on spiritual warfare. It was more sort of on disciplines and an obedient life. But he doesn't discount this because this is what the devil's trying to trip us up. So I went through and found, uh, and there's so much more. I mean, Lewis, you can never d finish mining him for some good things. So I know I've left some things out. But I just thought I would try to pick up on some major themes in his works on spiritual warfare and how the enemy works. Now, uh, we're, we're focusing more on the enemy. Uh, it, it tends to be a little more negative. I've, I've left it up to Lyle and Jerry and everyone else to give us the positive building up of uh, the spiritual life and how to combat these things, so we won't get into that too much here. Uh, that, that's why I prefaced with that scripture on the divine power, uh, lest you be discouraged and walk out of here, head, your head's hanging low. But we're going to focus on the wiles of Satan and his minions uh, more so than we are all of the solutions. So the first one is one that I call the lie. Lewis writes, um, it's Lewis, but keep in mind, this is screw tape speaking. And screw tape is a devil, if you haven't read it, and he's writing to some junior devil, uh, his nephew, in which he's trying to give him advice on how to trip up humans. So this is in that voice, okay? So if you hear the word enemy, it usually means God. Um, and if something is good for them, it's bad for us. So it's an upside down thing. So this is, this is uh, screw tape writing. He says, the fact that, our de that devils are predominantly comic figures in modern imagination will help you, help you the demon trying to tempt people. It will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, the mind of the human, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade that since he cannot believe in that, he cannot believe in you. Lewis also said in, in God on the Dock that the more a man is in the devil's power, the less he would be aware of it. I, I, on the principle that a man who is still fairly sober knows he's drunk. Think about that. The man who goes, I'm not drunk at all, has probably had one, one or two or three or five too many. But the man who's still fairly sober can recognize, take his keys out and go, David, I'm not driving home tonight. Same sort of thing. Those who do not know they're under, those who deny the, you know, the devil are probably more under his power than those of us who might even be in question. If you are sober enough to question it, then there's a good chance that you're on good, at least on more solid ground because you're able to question that. Devils exist. Their first aim is to give you an anesthetic, to put you off your guard. Only if that fails do you become aware of them. So complete ignorance of them is which I, you know, I call the lie. That is uh, one of the uh, successful schemes of the devil. Uh, John Ortberg wrote that the biblical writers lived in a world where the reality of the spiritual was taken for granted, but we live in a world where that belief erodes a little bit each and every day. We question these things. And even within the church, I mean, think about how many churches out there, you know, they may not question um, the, the, the life, death, and even resurrection, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, but Oh, there's no hell, there's no devil. My God would never do that. You know, we are very quickly pushing that part and selecting that part of the Bible out. So it's even in the church. It's not just, you know, the hardened atheist and the, the Richard Dawkins that are saying these sorts of things. Here's another one where he, he gets in against the truth. Uh, C.S. Lewis writes in The Problem of Pain, the enemy can exploit even truths to our deception. And I remember as a kid hearing something that, you know, the best lie is about 95% truth, right? In uh, A Slip of the Tongue, Wayne, uh, Wayne referenced this the other day in the panel, this great essay in The Weight of Glory. He says, indeed, I don't think the tempter often tries to deceive us after early youth with a direct lie. I mean, think about Luke chapter 4, where Jesus is out in the, in the desert and the devil tries to tempt him. What does he use to tempt him? What is he twisting 
to try to trip up, trip up Jesus, the Son of God? Scripture. Scripture. If He's going to do it with Him, He's certainly going to do it with us. So we have to be even careful with how we read and interpret and handle the Word of God because how many, you know, shysters are out there using it to their own advantages? Just think of prosperity gospel or things like that. And it doesn't always have to be uh, something absolutely malevolent, but think of something like the social gospel. We can very quickly build a social gospel that does not require uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, uh, the so, you know, we should all be interested in justice, but it should be an outworking of our life of Christ, right? So we can very quickly start to twist and isolate Scripture itself to support this. So Satan will use the truth to trip us up and to distract us from the capital T truth himself. Another one is the mind. We've surrendered the life of the mind. There's a friend of mine, a friend of mine, is, uh, uh, Bill's actually, a guy named Stuart McAllister. He told me once, he goes, you know, we seem satisfied with the Sunday school level of education. You heard Joel Woodruff talking a few minutes ago about why the C.S. Lewis Institute was, was launched because we have so many professionals out there. You know, whether it's athletics or academics or, or, or the business world or something like that, we, we are exhorted to pursue excellence. But when it comes to our spiritual lives, we're just kind of happy with that junior high flannel graph level of education. And uh, I know my books of the Bible, and I know a few basics. I can recite John 3, 16, but we don't go much deeper than that. But it, I think it, I would say it goes beyond that, too. Look at broader popular culture. Look at any news channel and see how sensationalistic and how shallow the news stories go. Uh, we're interested in 15-second sound bites. We're interested in bullets. You know, I remember uh, over a, a dinner once, Ravi was ta Ravi Zacharias was talking about why he doesn't go on news channels more often. He said, well, because they want me to answer these big questions in about 60 to 90 seconds, and I can't do that. And then, of course, you're at the mercy of their editing. Um, but you, it, some, of these answer, some of these questions take longer answers. And Philip Yancey, I remember reading an editorial by him when he was going on a tour, and this is about 10 or 15 years ago now. Uh, he was going on a tour promoting his book, and he talked about the difference between touring in the U.S. and touring in Europe. And he said, Europe is more spiritually dead in America. This is true, but they are much more interested in content, and they're more interested in engaging with real questions, whereas here in America, it was a lot of hot-button type issues. So we have really neglected the life of the mind. Uh, and, then, and he says this in screw tape. Once again, this is screw tape speaking. The way must be prepared for your moral assort, assault by darkening his intellect. Now, and uh, what are we um, encouraged to do in Scripture? Well, Romans 12, too. We've, I think we've, if we hadn't, he hadn't heard it directly already, we've heard it uh, tangentially and implicitly. That we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And again, our, my friend Stuart used to emphasize, not by the removing of your mind, but by the renewal of your mind. In, in the military, uh, we have, well, when we're, we're planning some sort of attack or assault, we identify what we call centers of gravity. In, uh, in our enemy. So when we had to go and invade Iraq or go into Afghanistan, we identified what we call centers of gravity, key areas of strength. And I would say that the mind is, the key, is a key area of strength for us. And if Satan can take that out, we are so much more susceptible to his attacks. So keep that in mind. Another one is influence. Again, screw tape, this time in the follow-up to, to the screw tape letters, an essay called Screw Tape Proposes a Toast. Screw tape is now sort of at a, a, a banquet full of demons, and he, he's giving a, a, you know, a very political type talk, and he says, every dictator, every demagogue, almost every film star or crooner can now draw tens of thousands of the human sheep with him. And this is before social media. There may be a time when we shall have no need to bother about individual temptations at all, except for the few. Catch the bellwether in his whole flock comes after him. This doesn't have to be a hardened atheist. It can be someone from within the church. Think about Matthew 24, 11, about many false prophets will arise and lead us astray. You know, just take a, think of, uh, I'll pick an easy target. Take a look at the big church in Texas with Joel Osteen. Paul also warns us that such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants, his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, but their end will correspond to their deeds. 
And then finally, uh, this is one I pulled uh, that is, I've found it in my life a lot. I, I call this one uh, his, his strategy of ambiguity. Um, Lewis is writing a letter and says, what the devil loves, loves is that vague cloud of unspecified feeling or unspecified virtue, a guilt feeling or unspecified virtue, which he lures us into uh, despair or presumption. Now, let's use the guilt for an example. Uh, in one second. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, the difference here is the Holy Spirit convicts, and he tends to convict us to something more specific. Whereas the devil will try to make you feel guilty, and it's usually something more vague and ambiguous. And the conviction should drive you to repentance. The guilt, this unhealthy guilt, will drive you to despair. So that's one example, I mean, of ambiguity. And you could take this on the other side of some sort of pride or satisfaction in what you do, and the pride could drive you to lofty heights, or the other one could help drive you to satisfaction in God. You yeah. had a question, sir? Um, C.S. Lewis spends a lot of time with this idea of pride in the screw tape letter. Mm -hmm. uh, in letter 26, he shows Wormwood how to drive a wedge between a husband and a wife yes. so that they have ill feelings toward each other. And he says, men, and it has to do with the, with the, the thing of of making gifts to charity. Mm -hmm. um, and he says that men have the tendency to be selfish. They, they have to think they have to be unselfish. And when they give a gift to somebody, they give it kind of with a tag on it saying, now, that person I gave a gift to owes something to me. <clears throat> Whereas for a woman, when she gives a gift, it's just a, a tremendous giving without anything expected in return. So when they even talk about how to tithe and what to do with their tithe, yeah. or, when, or how to help people, the husband always thinks, well, you know, now I'm doing this. I have some kind of a hammer over the head of the person that I'm doing it to. But for the woman, it's out of the heart. And this can drive a tremendous wedge between a husband and a wife. And we've seen it in our own marriage. Yeah. This type of tendency. Yes. It's human tendencies and twists them. And you can drive us to this ambiguous ground and sometimes just naming it. Uh, there was a time where uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm the one at fault, but we were, it was ambiguous, and I finally got my wife to admit she was mad at me, and I thought that was the biggest thing we could move, we, now we can move forward. I'm like, ah, now we know what it is, rather than, and sometimes we stay in those ambiguous realms, and sometimes we don't even know ourselves, and so I, I, I call the strategy ambiguity and ambiguity, and I think what this should drive us to is to know ourselves, to know the Word, which would drive us to know our creeds and our doctrine, which it's one of the strengths of something like liturgy and going through these things, refreshing ourselves with like the Apostles' Creed. We should know the words so we can become less ambiguous when we're on shaky ground. So those are the ones I highlighted. I thought now would be a good time for some discussion and hear more of what you think on those different strategies, how you might struggle, or is there, like, like he brought up, is there something else in Lewis that I missed that you'd like to share that has been just a theme, a drumbeat, that has been throughout Lewis. Because one of the things I love about Lewis is uh, he's so consistent and so coherent in his thought. And many times, you know, I'm, I know a Lewis quote, but I forget where it's from because it, he says these things over and over and over again. Um, you know, uh, Lyle, or uh, it was Jerry who made a comment about when are you reading Evelyn Underhill? And when you read writers, there are huge um, evolutions. But, you know, once Lewis got on solid theological ground, you know, he was fairly, fairly consistent. So I'm always forgetting where it's from. So I'm sure you've been impacted by something by Lewis. So feel free to add to the list. But um, I'd like to hear from you of your struggles or your victories um, or some things you've seen in others on how they overcame spiritual warfare in your own lives. Sir? It's, it's great that, uh, that so much is from screw tape letters. You know, I've, I've liked it before but I've been coming back to it a lot more as just a very central, useful thing for a Christian to, to constantly refer to and study. Because there's so much in there that, that brings it home 
the struggle, the spiritual struggle to ourselves and, of course, the people that we love and are around, uh, but primarily ourselves, and that that's where the struggle starts, you know, where he says that, uh, that God, the enemy, works from the inside out, and at any moment it could reach, you know, love toward his mother or something. Yeah. And a lot of times in our spiritual struggle, definitely the house that I was raised in, it was a lot more of the, oh, watch out for the devil. The devil could trip you up, you know. If, if something bad happens, it's because the devil got in there between you and God, and I guess God, they don't say this, but it's implied that somehow or another, God allowed the devil to, or God wasn't looking, you know, kind of forgetting the uh, Psalm 139 aspect of, he's so close you couldn't even move without him being there. But screwtape letters, I, I really appreciate just that, you know, our struggle is what with what we do, not with what happens to us. And so we need to work on ordering our lives and trying to help other people's spiritual struggles. And, and then, of course, there is an aspect of, you know, prayer for the good of the world and everything and elections and all those big issues that we're not really involved in and we don't know a lot. But we are very involved with ourselves and our, you know, our intimates and our friends and the people we're trying to help. That's why I like the screw tip letters. <coughs> Lots of reasons, but those are good ones. Yes, sir. No? Yeah, going on the screw tape letter, the thing that frustrating about spiritual warfare is that we want it to be a thing that we say we can identify clearly with boundaries that this is what we're fighting against. Whereas you said, <coughs> what, um, that it's, the devil cannot create virtue, we can only corrupt it. Yes. And how it goes back and forth where we can possess something that's great, but then it turn it, it cross over something and then it became used by the devil. Mm -hmm. So it's more, as we were studying in small group, it became more of like a daily discipline to uh, this understanding our hearts with God, like daily. It's like a every day, every minute thing versus like, oh, you know, it's a clear thing that is uh, against God, and that if we get rid of it, then we will be belong to God. Yeah, and it's like faith. You kind of have to you know, pick up your cross again every day. The struggle and spiritual warfare continues. You don't win it and move on. It, uh, and sometimes it's the same battles over and over, isn't it? And when Lewis talks about struggling against pride, you know, this, it comes right back and it makes you feel proud of Ah, I was humble right there. And he just, but he says, don't get all hung up. Just like it's sort of like whack a mole. Beat it down and move on, sir. Uh, I, I agree with Sean. Screw tape letters are wonderful. <coughs> and, uh, constantly bear rereading. Uh, but uh, one of the places where I think Lewis has the most to say about spiritual warfare is in the space trilogy. Hmm. Uh, you see that over and over and over again. The the struggles that Ransom has in making sense of these different worlds, and the temptations that come to him, uh, you know, and uh, the, out of the silent planet, his anthropomorphism and his, his uh, unwillingness to be prepared to see these creatures as, as sentient beings, but they're not like him. And in Paralandra, you see uh, the temptations that he has there, and uh, eventually ends up and a fight, um, and then, then in uh, the last one, you know, you have these these um, spiritual entities that are involved in very bureaucratic, uh, day in and day out kinds of things. You see how Stoddard uh, is seduced to be, become a part of nice and so yeah. forth. So um, uh, I find in rereading those, I'm, I'm constantly piqued by situations in my own life that are reminiscent of some of the struggles there. You know, my, uh, my desire to stay on the fixed land and not on the floating islands and all the rest. <laughs> I find them very helpful to, um, to sharpen my eyes and, and senses about such things. It's good. Thanks for uh, recommending the, the trilogy. Yeah. It's great. Joel. Could you go back a slide? Yeah. Um, what I find there is it's not only that I feel discouragement or despair, but 
but that I'm persuaded that I'm the only one. Mm. Oh, nobody understands. Nobody, you know, and one thing that impressed me about the conference was the emphasis on Lewis's ability to access God's Word, that he memorized God's Word, whether he was blessed with a photographic memory or whether he intended to memorize it. Because that's how you said the devil twisted scripture when he tempted Christ, and Christ quoted scripture right back at him. He didn't engage him in a discussion. Now, if we just reason together, I'm sure I can persuade you, but I have found that very important in my own life just to speak God's word of truth. And one thing that really encouraged me was to realize that Elijah himself, the great Elijah, when he ran away, because he had been through a major victory with God, he must have been exhausted, and he ran away, and um, and the voice said, "Why are you? What are you doing here?" And he said, "I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too." And what does God tell him? He said, you go back where you came from because I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and all whose mouths have not kissed him. And so, I'm sorry, I don't mean to go on and on. But, Preach it. But, you know, <laughs> it's not only that general, for me, it's not just that general kind of malaise and discouragement, but then he goes a step further. Oh, and Joel, you're the only one. No one can understand how bad you have it. You don't deserve this. And then you're you're believing lies about God. <laughs> and the best way to combat that is God's word. Yeah. Amen. Joel's in our fellows program this year, so these are the kind of people you get to hang out with if you ever join. <laughs> this is great. Yes, ma'am. Um, joining her on God's word, uh, one verse that really helps me in, I guess, like, spiritual warfare is in. John chapter 1, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Yes. And I think it takes light to illuminate the spiritual warfare is even going on. And yeah. so coming to this conference and being surrounded by people who love God has um, illuminated for me that I've really been in isolation lately. And so, um, yeah, I just am grateful for you guys and the light that... Well, now you're partly so... Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. When she just said, you know, like this uh, sharp uh, awareness, like she's the only one. Yeah. And, you know, like, you know I think that also uh, you have to be, I, I have to be careful, because that's like the devil's uh, attention for more, um, more of me. You know, like, oh, yes. okay, so I'm the only one. I know the whole group, and, you know, and I'm the chosen one, and I, <clears throat> or, like, I'm in this self pity. Oh, I don't want to give him that much attention, that much room. In, in, I know it, I'm aware of it. Just yeah. three years ago, I, I shared with some ladies here. Just three, three years ago, my son had a Halloween costume from Target, which was Satan. And I, it wasn't that I didn't consider myself a Christian. That's how he works. You know, I'm, I, I consider myself a good person. Just like you said, those social uh, evangelic people which teaches me not to judge them too harshly because they just don't know that they are the tool in the hands of daddy. That because that teaches me the compassion, like, mm -hmm. oh, you know that you are bad because you teach this, you know, contemporary or whatever. But I see a human being who is in, uh, you know, uh, just... Um, in the darkness. In the darkness, because he, you know, the, the devil is working on, on some whatever yes. project he has to do. The way he wants to be going to Target and getting the costume of his to, for my son to wear to Halloween party. But now I'm aware of it, and but I'm not going to give him that much attention to, you know, to dwell on him. Yes. I'm the only one. I found the best solution. It's like, stop it and go to service to another for, for, for someone else. And the service doesn't have to be anything big. It can be just a phone call to, sure. to another woman and, you know, focusing on, hey, how is your day? It's not about me. How is your day? How is your life? And that's, that's yeah, we can feel really 
self-absorbed on some of these things too. It can it absolutely can work that way. Anyway, Bill. Yeah, one of the one of the screw tape letters that is most helpful to me, and I found also to other people, is uh, letter eight, where he focuses in specifically on the law of undulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And he says uh, the the law of undulation is the repeated return to a uh, to a level from which they repeatedly fall back a series of troughs and peaks. And so he goes on to say, as screw tape is, is, uh, is uh, instructing Wormwood to say, that humans uh, naturally go through these troughs and peaks. And so don't think that this is necessarily to your advantage that the, that the human is in the point of the trough right now. Because, because the enemy, meaning God, often uses those times as the most transformative of uh, any you know, part of a person's life. That's right. Because when a human being is in the midst of those troughs and there's no sensory sense, you know, sense that God is present, and they go ahead and obey and do what God wants to anyway, that's the most transformative. And it may be in the end, when all is said and done, you look back, that people see that it was during those times that God brought about the most transformation, not when they were on some peak, you know, where God felt very close all the time. So that has really helped me, you know, to sort of get, uh, you know, you have these ups and downs. Yeah. And then also helping with other people who are in a time of trough. It may not be the enemy. It may just be that we're human. and But the enemy can make use of it if we, you know, if we allow that to happen. Yeah, the troughs can be, can be when we call on God the most when we need him. Um, I'm thought, I think of what Dallas Willard said. He said, I know God's address, the end of my rope. <laughs> so, um, well, we've got a couple minutes, and I thought I would close up with uh, some final thoughts here. And uh, with one encouragement, one tool, I won't maybe necessarily call it a weapon, but one tool that we can use in order to be successful in this. And it's been touched on on a few things, and it's perseverance. Again, screw tape talks about the talks about us. Uh, he says the long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather. You see, it is so hard for these creatures to persevere. The routine of adversity, the gradual decay of youthful loves and youthful hopes, the quiet despair, hardly felt as pain, of ever overcoming the chronic temptations with which we have again and again defeated them. The drabness which we create in their lives and the inarticulate resentment with which we teach them to respond to it. Think about resentment in your own lives. I, I have lots. All of this provides admirable opportunities of wearing out a soul by attrition. Lewis goes on to say, he says, if on the other hand the middle years prove prosperous, our position's even stronger. Prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, when really it is finding its place in him. His increasing reputation, his widening circle of acquaintances, his sense of importance, the growing pressure of absorbing and agreeing and of absorbing and agreeable work build up in him a sense of being really at home in earth, which is just what we want. You'll notice that the young men, that the young are generally less unwilling to die than the middle-aged and the old because we have a lot more at stake, right? And what was it Lewis was, or I mean, uh, Lyle was talking about with Chesterton being, you know, uh, at home here in the world, being homeless, feeling homesick. Well, that's their goal is to get us to stop feeling that way, to feel like we're at home in this world. Perseverance, that is one of the ways, and we do that through what Lyle's been talking about, through obedience and discipline and prayer and the spiritual disciplines. So I, I won't call this quite a discipline or a weapon, but this is one way we can, uh, we can succeed. And then also I want to remind you, and it came up, you know, if it wasn't said directly here, we've touched on it, that the small stuff matters. In Mere Christianity, Lewis says, good and evil increased at compound, increase at compound interest. That is why the little decisions you and I make every day are of infinite importance. The smallest act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later you may never be able to you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. 
And in Christian Reflections, Lewis writes that just as a Christian has his moments when the clamor of this visible and audible world is so persistent and the whisper of the spiritual world is so faint that faith and reason can hardly stick to their guns, so, as I well remember, the atheist too has his moments of shuddering misgiving, of an all but irresistible suspicion that old tales may after all be true, that something or someone from outside may at any moment break into his neat, inexplicable, mechanical universe. So even if you have doubts, and that's why Lyle said about this assurance, right? That you, have, you may, even in the midst of it, you may one day question everything. Don't feel bad because the, the, the atheist has it as well. He goes on to say that believe in God and you will have to face ours when it seems obvious that this material world is the only reality. Disbelieve in him and you must face ours when this material world seems to shout at you that it is not all. No conviction, religious or irreligious, will of itself end this once and for all. Only the practice of faith, resulting in the habit of faith, will gradually do that. Perseverance. When we exhort people to faith as a virtue, to the settled intention of continuing to believe certain things, we're not exhorting them to go against reason. The intention of continuing to believe is required because though reason is divine, human, reasoner, human reasoners are not. So when a passion takes part in the game, the human reason, unassisted by grace, has as much chance of retaining its hold on truths already gained as a snowflake has of retaining its consistency in the mouth of a furnace. The sort of arguments against which Christianity, which our reason can be persuaded and accept at the moment of yielding to temptation, are often preposterous. We often can believe some, some crazy things in the troughs and the peaks. Reason may win truths, but without, without faith, she will retain them just so long as Satan pleases. There is nothing that we cannot be made to disbelieve. That's what Joel just said. Reason, we can be talked into anything, right? There is nothing that we cannot be made to believe or disbelieve. If we wish to be rational, not now and then, but consistently, we must pray for the gift of faith, for the power to go on believing, not in the teeth of reason, but in the teeth of lust and terror and jealousy and boredom and indifference, that which reason, authority, or experience, or all three, have delivered us once for the truth. So we need to pray for faith. We need to persevere. And he says the practice of faith will lead to the habit of faith. And that takes discipline and obedience. But we have to first be aware that spiritual warfare is a real thing.